China has a complex history with Christian mission. We um, last semester discussed uh, the mission activity of the Church of the East and its own efforts at enculturation. Uh, the Church of the East appears to have died out significantly in China by um, sometime around the 9th or 10th century. Uh, but there was a desire uh, in Western Christianity in the 16th century for a mission to China. And we find that um, occurring with Matteo Ricci, a Jesuit, um, who uh, engages in a long series of mission um, there. And so we have a, a map of some of his journeys uh, to Goa in 1578, Macau, which is an island off the coast of China in 1582, and then finally arriving in Beijing in 1601. Uh, he is um, admitted to the imperial court in Beijing because he brings certain European inventions like astrolabes and various forms of calculations with mathematics that are intriguing to the imperial court and appear useful. So again, um, even though we're now back in the 16th century, we see how this interchange between technology, knowledge, and um, Christianity is very important in missionary contexts. What Matteo Ricci uh, seeks to do is what he calls a, a sinification of Christianity. Um, uh, Sino is the Latin word for China. So he wants to synthesize aspects of uh, Chinese culture, especially Confucianism as a system of thought, with European humanism. And so Ricci discovers through trial and error that actually going around dressing up like a beggar monk, um, which was his initial impulse, didn't work. Because those monks are associated actually with Buddhism, which was not an elite religion at this time. Rather, what gains him access is dressing like a, a Confucian scholar official. And so he drops the dress and titles of how uh, Confucian uh, um, would uh, project themselves. And he also, when he um, has uh, Chinese uh, a men who want to convert to Christianity, he makes them priests pretty quickly. Uh, now, we have to note that these are, uh, must be provisional ordinations where there's no bishop around to do the ordaining. That's another matter. So we have an image here uh, of the first Chinese Catholic priest, Zhu Guangyi, uh, who also uh, has a career as a scientist and mathematician. This image, we can see both Matteo Ricci and Zhu Guangyi uh, dressed um, as these sort of quasi-Confucian scholar officials. And so that gives an immediate sense of how uh, the, this is a Jesuit Catholic impulse to enculturate. This question of how to translate Christianity into um, a culturally appropriate form in China uh, is crystallized in something known as the Chinese rights controversy. And this is a debate that focuses on the question of, of what is worth keeping in Chinese culture, especially around rituals and civic life. So the Jesuits want to focus on what, uh, a notion of purifying traditional practices and perfecting them in Christianity. Now, uh, this really crystallizes around the debate on funeral rites, that is, rites offered um, when one dies and then practices of venerating ancestors and uh, with household shrines. Uh, this is associated with uh, values of filial piety in Confucianism. That is that part of one's duty is to always show honor to one's elders even after they're dead. And so is that an act of honoring or is that some kind of worship of the dead? is the Christian question. Uh, there's also, for those who are sort of these elite officials in the imperial court who want to be Christian, that there's various public rituals associated with Confucianism, especially the burning of incense in honor of Confucius um, um, at various occasions. And so the question is, are these practices of idolatry in a Christian context? And so the Jesuits offer a solution. 
They say, no, um, these ancestor rituals and these funeral rituals are not worship, but acts of veneration, acts of giving honor that makes them not idolatrous and thus acceptable. And similarly, these various uh, Christian, uh, or rather Confucian rituals, are not religious in nature. They are civil ceremonies, since Confucianism uh, was understood to be more of a moral, ethical system that related to the, the maintenance of society. And so the burning of incense is only showing respect for the memory of Confucius, not a worship of him. And any deity that might be invoked in these rituals really ought to be seen more as guardian angels, um, good principles that might guide one. In parallel, along with these ritual practices and issues around civic life, is a question of religious speech itself. That's what do you call God in Chinese? How do you refer to God? Or what are the terms you use that are acceptable? And the Jesuits discovered that they really had to invent a word to express the notion of a Christian God. So they came up with the phrase Lord of Heaven, which in Chinese is Tianzhu. And this uh, was kind of a neologism they invent. But there's confusions when at times Jesuits use this term Tianzhu or Lord of Heaven and make it seem equivalent with Chinese concepts like heaven or Tian or the Lord on high, Shangdi. And the question is, is there an exact equivalence between these, China, these traditional Chinese terms and Christian concepts of God? Or are Christian concepts of God uniquely situated outside of Chinese patterns of thinking? And so there's no possibility of equivalency of terms. There's something similar in, um, in the Arabic uh, linguistic context, the word Allah. Uh, is Allah simply the word for God? Uh, and can one refer to the Trinitarian God with the word Allah? Uh, if you ever attend an Arabic Christian liturgy, you'll find the use of the word Allah to simply refer to God generically. So this is only to illustrate that this is always a question of translation when Christianity moves from one linguistic zone to another. Now, Jesuits end up not being the only missionaries active in China. After a period of time, you have other European missionaries active, especially certain societies, uh, religious orders from France. And uh, these orders are in real rivalry with the Jesuits. And often these other missionaries uh, uh, um, are working with lower classes than the elites that the Jesuits work with. And um, according to these missionaries, the lower classes were really clear that, yeah, no, the, the, these rituals we do are religious in nature. And we are honoring gods uh, when we do these um, activities. Um, these missionaries also attacked the way that Jesuits were using theological language and making equivalencies between Chinese and Christian concepts. So this all comes to a head in 1693. By the way, we're like, 150 years past Matteo Ricci coming to China by now. In 1693, uh, the Emperor Kangji intervenes, and he rules that um, the various uh, rituals under debate are only civil in nature, and so he supports the, the Jesuit position. Uh, now, this is in keeping with what Kangji is trying to do, which is he's trying to... Uh, consolidate his own power. He's come to authority only recently. And he's trying to project himself as the wise ruler, the sage king that the Confucian tradition really values. The European missionaries uh, from France are not happy with this ruling, so they write to Pope Clement XI. Now, as you can imagine, in this time period, it takes a long time for correspondence to happen between Beijing and Rome. Uh, and so Pope Clement responds and um, rules against elements of the Jesuit cultural accommodation practices. So Pope Clement rules, no, uh, God may only be referred to as Lord of Heaven, Tianzhu, but not these other words like Heaven, Tian, or Lord on High, Shangdi. <coughs> he further rules that Christians are not allowed to perform 
or attend rites that honor Confucius and the ancestors. And that the papal legate in Beijing, that is the Pope's representative, who, by the way, is carrying this letter with him, has final authority on what activities in China are permissible or not by Christians. That is implicitly the emperor has no say. The Pope has final say. This infuriates the emperor, uh, John Kangji. And so by the time the letter in 1715 arrives in Beijing in the early 1720s, uh, six years have passed, but Kangji responds in 1721 uh, uh, with anger at this papal decree, noting the cultural ignorance it displays and the sectarianism that it uh, inflames. Sectarianism is always an ongoing concern with Chinese authorities uh, throughout the millennia. Sectarianism is the problem of religious division that might lead to social unrest. So Gangji's concern is that having various Catholic entities debating about religion will inflame social tensions. And he does not want that at all. And so what he does is he bans Westerners from preaching in China, and he significantly limits missionary activity. What this is going to do is cause um, Chinese Christianity to really go underground, when missionaries return in the 19th century, they discover pockets of Chinese Christians throughout the country, but it's not viable or vibrant um, by the time you get into the middle of the 18th century. This is also going to set up something we're going to look at in our last week of class, which is this ongoing tension between the Roman Catholic Church and Chinese authorities over how authority is um divided religiously between the authority of the Pope and the authority of a ruler. So in our final video, we're going to be looking at examples of Protestant activity uh, starting in the 19th century.